2 Timothy. I'm going to read the first 14 verses here of the first chapter. 2 Timothy. The Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve uh, from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Who have saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Wherefore, I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know who am, I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the former sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ. That good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. And verse number 8 is, is what I want us to think about. He says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. And I'm just going to, I'm going to kind of bring some things around here. Uh, and uh, we're going to end up in actually in James at the end. Uh, and then I'm going to give you some things to think about. But uh, the title is just this, Where's the Proof? Where's the Proof? And uh, let's pray. Lord, please help me now. Please, I pray. Holy Spirit, guide me, direct me. Help me to say what needs to be said. Help give me wisdom and direction. Speak to, through me. And Lord, please speak to every heart. Please just bless in a special way. May we all be better testimonies for you. Lord, please, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul tells us here in Timothy, uh, here, be not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Now, when we think of the word testimony uh, and such, here's what the word means. So sometimes we have different ideas and things. Of, uh, and things. But here's what testimony means, right? It means evidence or witness. It means evidence or witness. <laughs> It's like a witness in a courtroom testifying for or against someone, all right? So when, when, we, when we see the word testimony, we're, uh, it, it means um, evidence or witness and such, all right? Uh, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God has made sure there has been a testimony or evidence, if you please, of him and his work. There's always been something there, all right? Uh, let me let me let me let me give you some examples and explain what I'm talking about. If you go back to Exodus chapter number, um, uh, we'll just we'll, we'll go to Exodus chapter number 25. Exodus chapter number 25, uh, if you would, and verse number 16. Um, and then uh, and, and and all the way to, we won't read it all, but then uh, Exodus 25:16. Bible says, and thou shalt put in the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. He's talking about the ark of the covenant. And he's telling uh, Moses here, he says, I want you to uh, put some things in the ark of the covenant. I'm gonna, I want you to put some things in there and such. Um, and then go to Exodus chapter number 26 and verse number 33. Uh, when he says, and two boards shalt thou make for the corners of the tabernacle of the two sides. Oh, verse 33, I'm sorry. Uh, and thou shalt hang up the veil under the tax that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony, and the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the holy plate and the most holy. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. And thou shalt set the table without the veil and the candlestick over against the table inside the, the tabernacle toward the south, and thou shalt put the table on the north side. And if you keep on reading, and if you go back, you'll find that he had them put the 
the uh, the the, the testimony, the architect in the testimony, the ark of the testimony inside it contained um, a manna uh, from when the people were in the children of Israel. Uh, God says, "Okay, I want you to take some of that manna. I want you to put it in that ark of testimony." Uh, it also had Aaron's rod, Aaron's rod that budded. Remember uh, the people and stuff saying, you know, uh, what's so special about Aaron and, and that sort of thing. And uh, God said, okay, everybody get their rods. Moses said, get the rods out. And whoever's rod buds uh, is, is uh, who God has chosen, that sort of thing. And remember how Aaron's rod not only budded, but it bloomed and had, and had the olives on it. I mean, that's, that's, that's what God did there in things. So, uh, so he had uh, Aaron's rod, he had the manna, and then the two tables that, that uh, God wrote on the Mount, Mount Sinai, uh, and he wrote for Moses. He had those, those were put in the Ark of the Testimony uh, and, uh, and, uh, and such. And, uh, and the, the Ark of the Testimony was in uh, the tabernacle, and then when David or, or Solomon built the temple, then the Ark of the Testimony was actually put in the temple uh, and such. The, and so, so but, but it was there and God put that there for a testimony or for a witness or for an evidence of what God did for the children of Israel uh, and getting them out of the out of the, uh, the uh, hands of the Egyptians uh, into the wilderness and through the wilderness into the promised land and the Ten Commandments and such. So those were all there. They were all kept in there for evidence. That's why they called it. That's why he called the Ark of a Testimony. It was evidence and such. Uh, 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 of of the workings of God. All right. Now, if you go to Numbers chapter number one, Numbers chapter number one, um, and verse number fifty-three, the Bible says, "But the Levites shall pitch round about the tabernacle of testimony." That there be no wrath upon the congregation of the children of Israel, and the Levites shall keep the charge of the tabernacle of testimony. The Levites, the, one of their jobs uh, while they were traveling, and then once the temple was in place as well, they were, to, they were there to guard the testimony. They were there to guard it, to make sure no one would take it, to make sure no one would, would go off and, 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 and uh, run off with it and things. And so they were there to guard that evidence. They were there to... to um, to make sure that no one took it. No one uh, would uh, harm the evidence and such. Now that's a perfect picture. Now that was all the Old Testament. But it's also a perfect picture of, uh, of what's going on in the New Testament in the church age. Uh, as a, I am not a Levite. I am, I am a pastor who has been called by God to watch his flock and his, uh, his, his sheep and such. I am here. One of my one of my responsibilities as your pastor is to guard, help guard, help you guard your testimony. Uh, one of the things I do is why you know, the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. Uh, you know, the exhorting, the 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 reproving, uh, and such. Those are all things that I use that I need through the Word of God to help you guard your testimony because you are the testimony now of God. All right. Uh, we don't know. There, no one knows where the Ark of the Testimony is. Uh, no, one, no one knows where that's at. Some people think it's up in heaven. And it might be. I don't know. But we are now. We are the testimony. We are the testimony now. Our body is the temple which houses the Holy Spirit. And we are the testimony now of God. Of Jesus Christ. And so one of the things that I am to do is I am to help guard that testimony. That's why it's important. You know, that's why church is important because you come and allows uh, as an overseer, it allows me to be able to, to uh, be able to watch over to make sure uh, people, you know, people start wandering off or whatever that, that I can see that and, and uh, help them and keep them into the fold and keep their testimony, uh, uh, have a good clean testimony. All right. So that's our, but we are the temple now. We are uh, the, the, the testimony. We are the temple, the evidence of who Jesus Christ is. All right. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. First Corinthians chapter number 1. And verse number 6. Oops. 
This is Paul talking to uh, the church of Corinth. In verse number 6 he says, Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. All right? So he's talking to the people of Corinth here. He's talking to the church of Corinth. And he's saying, you know what? The testimony of Christ or the evidence of Christ is confirmed in us. So uh, when what what, uh, what we are now as Christians uh, uh, is we are uh, to be the evidence of who Christ is. All right. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this all about here in just a minute. So we are the evidence. We are the testimony of Christ. Uh, you know, we think a testimony, you think of, of, of a verbal testimony. I'm giving a testimony of my salvation or whatever. And that's fine and dandy. But we're going to see here um, that we're not just talking about a verbal testimony. We are like the Ark of the Covenant, if you please. We are like the, uh, 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 you know, uh, the Ark that contains the proof of God and what God has done. We are the, uh, the body, the temple. We are to be giving proof of who Jesus is and such. All right. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. And verse number 12. 2 Corinthians 1, 12. The Bible says, for our rejoicing is this, that the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. All right. Now, the word conversation here is not uh, uh, is not just talking about like uh, what we say. The word conversation here is what we say and do. All right. It's not dealing with just. A, a, a conversation I might have back and forth with with somebody. It's also talking about what we do. All right. Uh, you remember James. Uh, James talks about how we're supposed to not just be a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. And the reason being is, is because uh, the doing is, and we're going to see this, is the testimony. The doing is the testimony of Christ. All right. So our testimony of Christ is to be confirmed in us. The evidence of Christ. And that, is, and that is through our conversation or our life and such, all right? Now go to uh, 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 2 Thessalonians chapter number uh, 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1 and verse number 10. The Bible says, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. Why, uh, why did they believe? Because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So our, our testimony is used so that to help others believe in Christ. All right. Our testimony. I'm not talking about our evidence. Our evidence of Christ, not by just our words, but by our life, by our life is used to help others believe in Christ, all right? Now, uh, and that's why, that's why Timothy says to not be ashamed of the testimony of Christ. In other words, don't, uh, don't hide the fact that you're a Christian. Don't be ashamed of, of and, and not let people know uh, and, and such by your, by your life that you are a Christian, that you are identified with Christ, that you are a follower of Christ. All right. By the way, that's what baptism was. Baptism was an outward uh, 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 sign or an outward sign of the fact that you now are a Christian. You have now put your trust and faith in Christ. And I'm telling everybody I'm identifying with Christ. That was an evidence that was a testimony of Christ, all right, and such. So, so um, uh, our, we're not to be ashamed of that testimony. Our, our testimony in, uh, of Christ is to be confirmed in us. The testimony of Christ should be confirmed in us. And that is done through our life, through a conversation, through our life. And it is there to help others believe in Christ, to point others to Jesus Christ. Uh, and such and it's something that we should not be ashamed of we should not hide it we should not uh, uh, you know be a recluse when it comes to letting people know of our Christianity and such all right all right so I said all that now let me draw it together here of what he's talking about now go to Hebrews 11 1 all right 
Now go to Hebrews 11.1. 1. I'm going to try to draw this together and then, then I'm going to give you something at the end. Hebrews 11.1. 1. The Bible says, now faith is the substance or the confidence, the substance or the confidence of things, what? Hope for, all right? And, uh, and, and the evidence of things, what? Not seen. Now, wait a minute. Faith is the, 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 is the subs, substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Anybody here see Christ? Yeah, you can't see Christ. Can you not? No. No. Uh, all right. So now go to James chapter number two. Now go to James chapter number two. And we're gonna, I'm going to try to draw some of this together here uh, in this. James chapter number two. Oops, I thought that was unfamiliar. James chapter number two, verse number 16. And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? So we're talking about, he's saying, you know, you see somebody that, uh, uh, you know, that, that have needs and, 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 and you say, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you don't help them. What's a profit? And what kind of a profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is what? Dead, being alone or being by itself. In other words, uh, if faith, if, it, if there's no works involved, uh, it's dead. There's no profit to faith without works, all right? All right, now let's go on. Verse number 18. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me my faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. All right? Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. In other words, you know, there are people that believe in God, but just believing in a God is one thing, but the devils also believe. The devils aren't going to go, the devil's not going to go to heaven. All right, but let's go on. Thou believest that there is one, verse number 20. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? And this is a verse that's quoted a lot of times and some others right here and things, you know, that, uh, you know, you, and such, all right? But let's go on. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Now, when you look at that, you're saying, okay, uh, he got saved by his works because he was justified by his works. But let's go on, all right? Um, seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect or complete it was it was it was something that that was made complete it was something uh, that all right and the scripture fulfilled what saith abraham believed god it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of god you see then how that works by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, what Does God know everything? Yes. yes, he does. Does God need us to prove our faith to him? No. Uh, so who's, who is, how is this faith being justified? To who? It ain't to God. Because God doesn't need us to justify our faith. And he knows whether we believe in him or not. He knows whether we're saved or not. He knows what, what our heart is. So who are we trying to justify our faith to? Man. Man, all right? And he gives an example. Likewise, also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works. When she had received the messengers and sent them out another way. So he gives a perfect example how Rahab was justified when she let down the spies out of, uh, out of the city of Jericho and said, look, um, I will, I, you know, uh, I will save you and, and let you down and stuff and let you go free and such and not tell if you will save me. If you will make sure that that uh, uh, when you come in, that you'll not destroy me and my household. All right. So and they said, OK, uh, and, and things. And so the, they believed her by her works. All right. By what she did. So the faith is us justifying uh, um uh, us justifying our works is us justifying 
our faith in Christ on, what, on who Christ is. All right. It's not for God. It's for the law so that we are the evidence, the testimony of who Jesus is. All right. All right. So um, our lives and our speech are to be giving and being evidence of our faith on who Jesus is. That's what, that's what it's all about. All right. Think about this. If Jesus were on trial today, and by the way, he is on trial, right? In every, uh, the mind of, of, of everybody, he is on trial. But if he were on trial today, and we were his only witness, his only evidence, if the only pre proof we have of who Jesus is, is through our words, and backed up by our life, which is our works, would we give the lost enough evidence for them to believe in Christ? Think about it. If you had a, a room full of lost people, I mean a whole a whole room full of lost people, and you want to prove to them Jesus Christ, and that proof is only going to be by your evidence of your life. Not just what you say, but also what you do and have done. And so they take and, and they put you up here and they and they put you on the stand. And then they take and they, they look at your life. They examine your life. And when they're doing what they're doing is, is they're 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 examining your faith. Is what they're doing. Okay? So they're examining your faith. And they're looking at, at that, and, and they are looking, and they're looking and seeing where Christ is in your faith. They're trying to see Christ. Now, um, would, would, that, would that examination that they did on you be enough for them to say, I believe what he's got is true? Would that be enough to make it, your, that faith perfect? You see what I'm saying? What kind of evidence are we of who Christ is? What kind of evidence are we showing who he is? We cannot see Jesus Christ. There's some people that say, well, I just saw a hundred foot Jesus. Well, they either, they either uh, uh, smoked some wacky weed or, or uh, you know, or done something. Uh, but they, no one saw a hundred foot Jesus. You know, it, it's just not right. Well, I dreamed about it. Well, you had too much pepperoni on your pizza before you went to bed. Something. But, uh, but that's not true. We don't see who he is. We don't see him. One day we will. When he comes back in the clouds and the, and the clouds are rolled away and the trumpet sounds and, and, and a shout is made. And we go up to, and be with him together in the air with him up in the heaven. We'll see him one day. But right now we don't. So then how is then the lost then able to see Christ? By our faith. Our faith then is seen through our works. That's, our, that's the evidence. Our works, our life is the evidence of Christ. Now my question is, are we representing and giving people the lost world enough evidence of who Christ is that they are willing to turn to Christ for their salvation. That's the key. What kind of proof are you representing to have somebody who is not saved say, I want what they've got. I want that Christ. What kind of proof? What kind of characteristics are you uh, representing as far as characteristics of Christ? That's how you're going to show Christ is through his characteristics, are you not? Right? So let me give you some things and we're going to be done, but let me give you some things on some characteristics of Christ that we should be showing the lost world as evidence of who Christ is. So we give them enough proof, not just verbally, but through our life, enough proof for them to see our faith by our works, our life, 
to put their trust and faith in Christ like we did whenever we did. All right? Let me give you a few of them. All right, turn to 1 John 4, 8. 1 John 4, 8. Well, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to elaborate on all these, but uh, let me give them to you. 1 John 4, 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. God is love. What proof do you have to give to this world the love of God? What proof do you have to give to this world the love of God? What is it Jesus said? There, uh, what a, no greater thing, no greater love than than no man, no man to, uh, uh, that no man could give than to lay his life down for his brother. And we're talking about laying your life. We're talking about uh, dying for somebody. Now, our problem is, is in showing the love of Christ, or do we go that far for people? Well, you know, I'm a little busy today. I wouldn't help you, but I'm, I'm busy. Really? Is that the love of God? Is that showing love? And, you know, if, if you're willing to die for somebody, you're not going to say, oh, wait, wait a minute. Uh, can you come back tomorrow and do this again tomorrow? Because I won't be quite as busy tomorrow. Maybe I'll take the time to, to, to step in front of him and, and take that bullet for you. And we're talking about, we're not talking about dying for them. We're talking about most of the time, we won't take enough time to help somebody just with a, a little need. Let alone die for them. You mean you want to take, you want me to take time out of my busy schedule to help them? You mean tell me you want me to take a Saturday, a couple hours on a Saturday to go try to be a blessing to some older people? That's my Saturday. Well, if you won't do that, you dead sure ain't going to stand in front of them and take a bullet for them. You see what I'm saying? We need to take and show the love of Christ. We need to show proof of God's love. Deuteronomy chapter number 32. Deuteronomy chapter number 32. Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. Numbers and Deuteronomy. 32.4. The Bible says, He is the rock, His work is perfect, for all His ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is He. God is just. He's just. He's just. Do we show and, and treat each other justly? You know, it, it's sad. Sometimes we Christians, someone someone messes up and, 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 and such, and, and, and all of a sudden we're ready to excommunicate them and and, and all this other stuff, and oh my, you know, blah, 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 they can't come anymore, they can't do this, they can't, and because look what they did, oh, that's so bad. Well, who says that that's any worse than what you do? The problem is, we're not just. You know, did Jesus die for everybody? Yes, he did. He died for the whole world. He died for, for the mass murders. He died for anybody and anybody who wants Christ. He died for them. And he will not turn anybody away that comes to him. That's just. Whoever walks through that back door, if they want to come in here, they ought to be able to come in here. And we ought not turn them away. Well, you don't know what their life is. Well, let's play, let's play a week of your life 24-7. Uh, and stuff, including your mind and stuff. And let's, let's, let's see how clean you really are. You see what I'm saying? We look at ourselves, we'll realize we're no better than anybody else. So we need to learn to be just, just like God is just. All right? That's how we represent Christ. All right? Uh, go to Psalm 116. Psalm 116. Psalm 116. And verse number five. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is what? Merciful. Merciful. How much mercy do we show others? 
How much mercy do we show others? You know, this usually this is usually done by the ones that we love the most. We show less mercy to. It's amazing. Well, you know, 15 years ago, you know what you did? Really? Really? Is that showing mercy? You know, uh, we need to learn to be merciful to others. We need to learn to show that mercy to others. Deuteronomy 7, 9. We're not going to go back to it, but he, uh, God is faithful. God is faithful. You can look it up. God is faithful. If we were to take and, and, and look at our Christianity, could we say that we have been faithful in our Christianity? I'm not just talking about church. I'm just talk, I'm talking about Christianity in general. In your life. Have you been faithful? Has God been able to count on you? How many times have we, and I've done it, I, I, I've done it, I'm just as guilty as anybody. How many times have we promised God, God, if you help me here, I'll do this. We get help and we don't do it. Is that faithful? No. No. But yet when we hold God, we want to hold God to the fire. God, you said in your word, if you if we do this, you do this. Now you said it. Well, how fair is that to hold him to fire? But yet when we've promised God things, we haven't fulfilled them. Faithfulness. You know, the people out people out in the world, they, they know, uh, especially your neighbors and your workers and stuff like that. They know uh, who you are. They know you go to church. They know, they know, uh, and stuff, and know that you're a Christian. You know, every time you miss, they, they, I mean, people aren't stupid here in Macomb. Everybody knows everybody around here. I mean, I mean, look, they could tell you, they could, you could probably go down the street right now, and uh, or, or Monday, and they could probably, probably some people in the stores tell you what I wore churches today. I mean, this is Macomb. I mean, that's Macomb. We know everybody. You know everything about everybody. And uh, everybody's brother and sister and, and, uh, and uh, six generations down the road. I mean, it's just Macomb. Now, the sad thing is, they also know when you don't come to church, when it's church time. Because they know when we have church. Now, if that's the case, then is that showing the faithfulness of God? You see what I'm saying? We, we, we've got to make sure that we are representing Christ the right way because our faith is only given out uh, and such and completed by our works. And our works are through our life and our conversation. So we need to be representing Christ through these things. Uh, it, Psalm 119, 14. He is our redeemer. He's our redeemer. Now, there isn't anybody in here can redeem anybody as far as saving anybody from hell. Nobody can. Only Jesus Christ can do that. But when's the last time you helped somebody? When's the last time you helped somebody? You said they're always blowing money. So am I. And so and now God helps me. You, you blow money too. And God's helped you. You always sin, I always sin, but God still saved us. He redeemed us. Look, I'm just saying we need to get to a point where we are helping people. Not just people of the church, anybody. Christmas time is a difficult time of year for a lot of people. You know, uh, learn to be a helper. Listen to your heart and listen to the Holy Spirit as he deals with you. And, and if, he, if he speaks to you to help somebody, help them. You see somebody have a need? Help them. Help them. All right? And then Psalm 99.5, the Bible says that he is holy. Holy. We need to live a life separate from the world. We need to live a life. A, a holy, clean life. Set apart. It's going to be hard for you to go into the bar and sit down at a bar 
And even if you're drinking a Coke and others are drinking and everything else all going around you and say, hey, let me give you one of my brochures. In fact, don't give them one of mine with my picture on it, okay? Don't do that, please. Uh, you know, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but it's going to be hard for you to say, hey, you know what? Why don't you come to church Sunday with me? I'm a Christian. Why don't you come to church with me Sunday? Let me tell you how good God's been to me. Really? Is that really the kind of place that is going to help you convince others about Christ? We've got to live a life holy and clean as we can. We're not going to be perfect. But we ought to strive to, to do better. We ought to strive to live better. We ought to strive to live cleaner and purer. You know, it's his love and God is love and it's his love that stimulates all these other things. The justness, mercifulness, faithfulness, his redeeming power, his holiness. Those are all, those all come from the love. That's why in, in 1 Corinthians, what is it, chapter number 11 talks about, uh, not 11, 13, the love chapter, charity. Without charity, these things are, are, are not going to really be as, as valuable. Why? Because it is the love is the thing that binds it. The love is the, what motivates you to be just. The love is what motivates you to have more mercy. The love is what, what, what uh, causes you to be more faithful and, uh, and help others and be holy and clean and pure. It's the love. It's the love of Christ. Uh, my question to you today, and especially during the holiday season, as you go and you visit your friends, your loved ones, you know, they come over during Christmas, New Year's, and all that. What, and many times that's the only time you see them throughout the year. What kind of evidence are you presenting to them of who Christ is? Where's the proof that they have? Of your faith. It is only by your works. Not just your verbal. But by your actions. Your life. Where is the evidence. Of Christ in your life. In this prayer. Heavenly Father thank you Lord for your goodness. Lord I pray you please just bless. Lord I pray you help us all Lord. Including this preacher. To be. The right kind of testimony for you. And be that, that witness, that evidence for you of who you are. Lord, may not just my words do that, but my life, my actions. May I emulate you and who you are to the best of my ability. So others see my faith in you through my works. Lord, please help, I pray. 